Love the baptisms. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Enjoying the summer, I hope? A little bit? It's good. It's good. Well, this, uh, this past week, we celebrated the 4th of July, and our family uh, packed up the cooler with, full of drinks. We packed up our backpacks uh, full of uh, snacks, and we jaunted off to one of my favorite places in the world. You know where it is. It's Kennywood Park. And as many of you know, our family makes several trips to Kennywood every single year. Loving Kennywood in our house is simply not an option. It is a requirement. Well, this trip to Kennywood was a little bit different for our family because this time, in addition to myself and Kim and Chris and Kaylee, we also had Matthew, our nine-year-old, in tow. And you see, Matthew is not as accustomed to the Kennywood scene as the rest of us are. Uh, you know, initially even, Matthew wasn't quite ready for the barrage of Kennywood that was headed his way. And uh, he was a bit reluctant, I might say, to get in line with our expectations. And he's an inquisitive young man. He's an, he asks lots of questions. And he had lots of questions on Wednesday. I mean, lots and lots of questions. He had approximately 2,473 questions in the first two hours, okay? Questions like, well, why does the wood on the jackrabbit shake so much when the coaster goes down the hill? How, how well do you think the jackrabbit is fastened to the ground? How often do they replace all that wood on the jackrabbit? Why isn't it made out of steel? Isn't steel stronger? When was it built? Were you born in 1927? How fast does it go? How high is it? Can the coaster jump off the tracks? Is there a belt to hold me in? How tight should it be? Is this tight enough? When will it start? Why do we have to go on the jackrabbit again? Lots and lots and lots of questions. And there were times when I, I just wanted to answer with the answer that's been accredited and given approval by the parent society of the world, the answer is, just because I say so, okay? I was tempted many times. Well, that's, that's probably not the best answer to ever give your child. But oftentimes, when we ask God a question, sometimes the very best response we can get from God is when he says, because I say so. We're going to look at that today in Luke chapter 5. I invite you to turn there. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to read today verses 1 through 11 of Luke chapter 5. And we're going to be talking about a time when Peter did something because Jesus said so. Luke chapter 5, friends, what I read to you now, make no mistake, this is nothing less than the inspired word of God. Hear what God has to say to you this day, at this time, in this place. The word of God. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. 
So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word that comes to us fresh every time we open Scripture. And I pray, Lord, that you would come to us here today, right now, and fill us with your spirit that we might hear once again your word fresh and new. Lord, teach us, instruct us, take us and and form us, as it were, with your hands by your word. Bend us to your will and let us see what it is you have for us. Father, forgive me for the mistakes I will make. Wipe them away from our memories and minds. But Lord, everything that is true and lasting, that's in accord with your word, let those things take root in our hearts. We bear fruit in our lives for your kingdom. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in uh, Luke chapter 5, we find Jesus very early in his ministry. And he's teaching the people, and there's so many of them there, they're crowding him in, and, and he's, he's being backed up against the, uh, the sea. And uh, he got into a boat, and he went a little ways out so he could have some room, and everyone could see him and hear him. And it probably was early in the morning or so that he was doing this because the fishermen were washing and mending their, their nets from the night before. Because fishing was, at night, is the, is the best way to fish in that place, in that lake. Now, Jesus, of course... He'd been taught the trade of carpentry by his earthly adoptive father, Joseph. And uh, Joseph taught him how to work with a wood chisel and how to work with a hammer and nails. Carpenters told, if you put a piece of wood into the hands of Jesus, he would know what to do with it. Now maybe from time to time he went out with Joseph or his friends and, and he went fishing. Maybe he did it. He probably did. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say so, but he probably did. But Jesus was not a professional fishermen. On the other hand, Peter, whose original name was Simon, and the two brothers, James and John, they were pros when it came to catching fish. They had the equipment, they had the boats and the nets, they had the experience, they had the know-how, they knew the lake, they knew where the fish were, they knew the best times to go out to have a successful catch. But in verse 4, we have Jesus, the carpenter, telling Peter, the professional fisherman, how and where and when to go and do his fishing. And Jesus said in verse 4, Peter, go out into the deep water and throw your nets out there for a catch. That would be like me sort of telling Tim how to cook. Okay, that, That's kind of what that would be like. That would be like anybody telling Becky Haberlin how to bake a coconut cake. Okay? And if anybody sees Becky, tell her that I haven't had a coconut cake from her in a long time, and I really would like one. Okay. It would be sort of like Matthew telling me to hurry up and get in line to get on the jackrabbit. That's, kind of, that's what that would be kind of like. Okay. Jesus says, go on out there, cast your nets for a catch of fish. Go ahead, go on, and do it. And Peter responds to Jesus, and his response that he gives comes in, in two parts. And if you listen closely enough, You might even hear yourself or how you might be inclined to respond the way that Peter does. Because I think all of us are prone to respond to God in a similar way when he calls us to do something. The first response Peter makes to Jesus is his natural response. His first response to Jesus is born out of his normal, everyday humanity, based upon his own experience, limited by his own imagination, not allowing for any other possibility. Peter says this, Jesus, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. Now, now, I'm going to read between the lines here a little bit. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty. I'm going to read what I think Peter is thinking here, okay? I think Peter is simply giving voice to the first thought that's on his mind. And, and that's Peter's nature. Peter often speaks before he thinks. He, the first thing, as soon as Peter thinks, he, he talks. Okay, he's doing the same thing here. And here's what I think he is thinking. He's thinking this. I know how to fish, Jesus. Do you see how there's like, there's like no fish in our baskets right now? Do you, do you see that? Well, well, that's because there's no fish out there, okay? Because if there were some fish, 
We would have caught them. We know what we're doing. So, so, so why bother? What's the sense? What's the use in going out and doing this thing? Why bother? Maybe you've had someone say that to you when you were passionate about doing something. Maybe when something you wanted to do that didn't make sense, maybe someone told you that same thing. Why bother? What difference could you possibly make? Maybe you've said it to someone else. Why, why bother? I'm sure some people said that last year to, to Jim and Francie McKenna, or at least thought that whenever they said they were going to go to Africa on a medical mission last year. I'm sure a lot of folks said, why, why would you do that? Why would you go halfway around the world? There are enough troubles here, Jim and Francie. Why do you need to go traipsing across the world? You know, there's stuff to do here. Do you really think you can make a difference? Why would you leave your two daughters behind? Why would you put yourself in harm's way? Why, why bother? What if something happened? My goodness. What if something happened? Well, that's the whole point of it, isn't it? That something would happen? Yeah? So, and you know what? Something did happen. A lot of somethings happened for Jim and for Francie. And at least one of those somethings was a someone, at least one, a little boy named David that they told us about last year. Last year when they went for the first time, David was two years old and he weighed 22 pounds total. And he couldn't run and play like the other children because he had, has a heart defect, a heart failure. He'd look at you with one eye closed because the other eye had a, a muscle malfunction, a virus of sorts, and he couldn't focus with two eyes, so he kept one closed. And his mother called it his, his broken eye. But because of the work of the group that Jim and Francie went with, David received heart surgery, and he received a pair of glasses. And today, as of last week when they saw him, he's a three-year-old who's gained 12 pounds, and he's playing with other children, and he's got a set of glasses, and he's doing everything you would expect a three-year-old child to to do. I'm sure that Jim and Francie had some reservations about going the first time. I'm sure they had some second thoughts about making a trip to Africa, but ultimately they came to a point in which they were able to say, but because you say so, we're going to go. That's what Peter says in the second part of his two-part response. Yeah, I finished, I fished all night, I caught nothing out there because, because there's nothing there. But because you say so, Jesus, because you say so, I will let down the nets. We pick it up then in verse 6. Look at verse 6. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Peter couldn't have imagined catching a single fish. He knew that he could not, and he was 100% correct. He couldn't catch a single fish, but Jesus loaded up two boats full of fish, and the nets were breaking under the weight, and the boats were in danger of sinking. Jesus moved. Jesus worked. He made a way. He blessed. He poured down grace. He showered grace. He gave to Peter more than he could possibly ask for or even imagine. That is what Jesus Christ does. And when he does that, he elicits a response. He makes a way for change to take place in people's lives. He makes space for life transformation. Look in verses 8 and 9. We see it there. They're all astonished at the catch of fish they've taken. And when Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. When God shows up, when God moves, when you become aware of being in the presence of God, there is only one proper response that we can give, and that's the response of humility. Humility. When you enter the presence of God, you suddenly become aware of your weaknesses and his strength, of your frailty 
and his greatness. You become aware that what you thought was impossible has become absolutely a reality. That is what Jesus Christ does. And all at once, when you've finally been emptied out of yourself, you're ready to respond finally to the call that God gives. You're then ready to receive the invitation that he makes when we come to the end of our plans, the end of the folly that we can control this life. It's then that we come to the point when we can hear the voice of Jesus. Listen to what he says. Look, look at verse 10. It is beautiful. It's what Jesus says. To, it's what he says to each one of us when we come to the, when we say, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. He doesn't chase us away. He doesn't, he doesn't push us aside. He says to Peter, yes, Peter, yes, sinner, come to me just as you are, and don't be afraid. And from now on, you will catch not fish, but men. The power of Jesus Christ doesn't cause us to fall back and withdraw from God. The power of Jesus Christ draws us closer, draws us more near, not just into the presence of God, but even into his work, his work of the kingdom. We're invited to be children, living, breathing children of the living God, not, not make-believe children, not Facebook friends, not pen pals, but living, breathing sons and daughters of God. We're called to be citizens of the kingdom of God, not onlookers, not casual observers, but active citizens of the kingdom. And that is what you are if you are in Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid. Go into the deep water and cast your nets because he says so. And he even invites one like me, even ones like yourself. Friends, this coming week, we celebrate the invitation and the call that Christ makes on our lives to follow him, to love him, to serve him. We'll go out for a week, a single week, that we call Aliquippa God's holy ground. And some have said, and some will continue to say, why bother with that? Because don't you know Aliquippa died 25 years ago? Don't you know there's nothing there to be saved? Don't you know it's a place of poverty and crime and drugs and prostitutes? Why would you even bother? Do you think you can make a difference? Who do you think you are? And the answer is, I can't make a difference. I can't do a thing. I can plan. I can raise money. I can do all sorts of things in my own mind. But I cannot make a difference. But Jesus Christ can and he does. Exceedingly, abundantly more than I could ever ask or even imagine. When we go in motion in the path of Jesus Christ, wonderful things take root, things blossom that we could never even imagine or plan. Whatever our doubts might be, whatever misgivings we might have, regardless of what anyone says or thinks, we are called to not be afraid and to go because he says so. Amen? And he even calls us. This is your, this is your great God. He calls a sinner like me. He calls a sinner like you to come and dine with him at his table. The God of all creation has said, pull up a chair, if you will, and come and sit at my table and be my friend. And we celebrate that invitation today. We do not take this lightly. This is a beautiful remembrance of what Jesus Christ has sacrificed and done for each and every one of us. And on that night that he was betrayed, that night when we gave him over because of our doubts, because of our fears and our anxieties, on that night that we betrayed him, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and friends and he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body and I'm giving it for all of you. Then after supper, he poured, saying, this is, 
the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again and our Lord will come again and make all things new. Amen. You are invited to come and feast at the table of the Lord. We celebrate here at Mount Carmel an open table. You need not be a member of this church. You need not be a Presbyterian. We do ask that you would be a baptized member of a church practicing somewhere, that you understand the gravity and the grace of the table. And if you do, we invite you to come forward as a son or a daughter of God. If you would like to take communion at your, at your seat, please tell your usher. They'll bring you a cup and a piece of bread to your, to your pew. Come and eat at the table of the Lord.